C is a bit of an archaic language. It was created around the time the Unix operating system and the home computer were invented. And during this time period, computers were far, far less powerful than they are today. To give a comparison, a cheap $100 computer today is orders of magnitude more powerful than the most expensive computers back in the day when C was first created. The Cray 1 was the most advanced supercomputer around the time when C was created. The Cray 2 came out after the Cray 1 in 1985, and the iPhone 12 still ends up being around 5,000 times more performant than the Cray 2, which is absolutely insane. So why does this matter? Well, C's low-level capabilities and the ability to work with raw memory wasn't just desirable and a nice-to-have feature at the time, but an absolute vital necessity. Today, this fine-grained control over memory is still needed for things like microcontrollers and firmware programs where memory is often scarce. Just as an artist wields different brushes to create more intricate and detailed strokes in a painting, programmers utilize pointers to achieve fine-grained control and efficiency in their code. Pointers serve as powerful tools for for manipulating memory directly. Today, we'll discuss pointers, what they are, how they're used, and why we use them in the first place. We'll mostly be using C++, but a lot of the ideas of what we're doing will ultimately come from C. We may or may not briefly use Go or Rust to prove some points, but there's a pretty good chance that we won't. Every time I've said I'm going to use something besides C++, I end up using only C++, so we will see what happens. The reason we're going to be using C++ and not C is because instead of using printf and having to use a bunch of different format specifiers, we'll just bypass all of that and you see out instead because I'm lazy. There are also a few differences in C++ that make things that we'd normally be doing in C a lot easier, so we'll cover some of that as well. Note that I am not an experienced C developer. This is a video on pointers, not about memory management in general, so I would be a little bit careful about using anything that we're going to be doing today as a basis for doing firmware programs, kernel code, or embedded software, because I don't want to be held responsible for any of that. This is more for learning purposes only and for understanding the core concepts of pointers, not about writing safe code. With that being said, I will be attempting to write things as safe as possible to the best of my ability, and if I am unsafe in some way, just let me know in the comments and I'll pin your comment to the top if it is helpful. With that being said, and that out of the way, let's write some probably unsafe C code all in the spirit of learning about pointers. Before we can even start discussing pointers, we first have to discuss memory. Your computer, or any computer really, has something known as random access memory or more commonly referred to as RAM or just memory. Now as a program is running, it will allocate or reserve slots in RAM for the different pieces of state, aka the data or variables in the program. This data can exist in the form of data structures like arrays, structs, or objects. These slots of memory are known as memory addresses. Some will use the analogy of street addresses in the way that addresses are where the pieces of memory live. Personally, I just think of RAM as a hash table. Whenever we declare a variable, whether it be initialized or not, we are allocating memory and reserving some space in RAM. Declaration is the act of giving a variable a name and a type, but doesn't describe actually giving the variable a value. Initialization is giving a variable a value for the first time. A variable is just a way to store data, but if we understand that a variable is just the label to a memory address that maps to a value, we can effectively say that a variable is a reserved piece of memory that labels the value of a memory address. Okay, now what if we wanted another variable with the same value as the first? We could just declare another variable and set it equal to the previous variable. And sure enough, both variables have the same value. We can determine the memory address of any variable just by adding an ampersand before it. Now we can see where every variable is being stored in RAM. Currently, we can see that our variables have different memory addresses, and this will always be the case no matter what. Though they're the same value, they are not the same variable. They are separate pieces of memory. And this makes sense. If we alter the value of one variable, the other variable is unaffected because they live at different memory addresses. So what is a pointer? A pointer is just a variable containing the address of another variable. This should be a very simple concept now that we understand what memory addresses are. We literally just set a variable to the address of another, and we now have a pointer. The syntax for creating a pointer may seem weird at first, but essentially we just add an asterisk before the variable name to declare that the variable is a pointer. To get the value of a memory address, we can simply use an asterisk, which dereferences the memory address giving us the value. And dereferencing is the act of retrieving a value at a particular memory address. It basically means, get me whatever value is at the address x. The most confusing part about this is the fact that dereferencing a pointer and declaring a pointer look virtually identical. So it's hard to distinguish the difference if you're not paying attention. Now let's say you wanted to copy the value of the original variable using a pointer. All we would have to do is set a new variable to the value 
value of the memory address of the pointer that pointed to the original variable. This is essentially the same as what we did before with copying a variable's value, and just going through more hoops. We can also update the value of the dereference pointer to update the original variable's value, therefore the value is no longer a copy, but the exact same value in memory as the original. Altering one will result in both being altered. Printing both the dereference pointer and the original variable will lead to having the same value printed. So, if it's more complicated and annoying to use pointers, and variables can serve a similar purpose, why on earth do they exist in the first place? C is a bit of an archaic language. It was created around the time the Unix and the home computer were invented, as previously discussed, and computers were far less performant than they are today. As stated before, C's low-level capabilities and the ability to work with raw memory was not just desirable, but a vital necessity during the time period for getting the most out of the hardware. Today, this fine-grained control of memory is still needed for things like microcontrollers and firmware. Pointers allow you to work with memory more effectively and efficiently by providing direct access to memory addresses instead of copies. As someone once said, it's easier to give everyone the address to your house than to give everyone a copy of it. This cuts down on memory usage. Most programmers today don't really have a need for pointers in the majority of scenarios since pointers add unnecessary complexity to a code base and make maintainability a headache. Nah, bro not to mention the complications and detrimental consequences that pointers can have if used incorrectly. If this is the case though, you might be asking, why does C use pointers so heavily, even now? C, being the ancient language that it is, has a lot of missing features. It was derived from the B language, which was a typeless language. The type system mostly came from, or partially came from, Algol. So many of C's features were either completely new or experimental. This is why many regard it as the mother of all languages. Many of the syntax decisions made by C would spread to most modern languages afterwards. C doesn't have true native support for strings. It doesn't have a way to mutate function parameters directly, and arrays in C are nothing more than a glorified group of memory addresses, essentially just a pointer to a reserved block of memory in RAM, where the addresses are next to each other sequentially. Hopefully you're following so far. In C, an array is just a pointer to the start of a reserved block of memory. Therefore, the entirety of the array is not stored within the array itself, but just a pointer. This contrasts a language like JavaScript that stores the entirety of the data structure in the array itself. Therefore, printing the array prints all of the values within the array. But in C, this is simply not the case. We can prove this by retrieving the value of the array itself, which essentially is the same as retrieving the address of the starting index 0. If we dereference the array, we get the value at index 0. The following two expressions are identical. So if we index the array, we are essentially just incrementing the pointer. Hopefully this makes sense, therefore if we say array index 2 is equal to 4, we are saying set the value of the memory address of the array plus 2 addresses forward to the value 4. And retrieving the value is the same, we are simply using a pointer to retrieve the value of the memory address of the array to memory addresses forward. Whenever I refer to a block of memory, you can think of it almost identically to me saying array or list. The distinction doesn't really matter that much. Other than being slightly misleading, this implementation of an array has a lot of hidden limitations. For one, the program has to remember the length of the array separately. There is no way of passing a copy of an array as a function parameter like a normal variable because it's just a pointer, so you're just copying the pointer instead. And lastly, manipulating an array requires you to manipulate each element individually instead of working with the array as a whole. It's also worth noting that this array system is statically allocated, meaning that the reserved memory is determined at compile time and can't be changed during runtime. If the length of the array depends on user input or or any type of data that changes and can only be known at runtime, this type of array system will not work. C has other ways of working around this, however, which we will soon discuss. If you can at all help it, you should use statically allocated arrays because they are allocated on the stack, and the memory is immediately deallocated once it leaves scope. Sort of how memory works in Rust, uh, I think at least. But sometimes you need dynamically allocated memory, which is heap allocated. Dynamically allocated arrays are created using malloc, which stands for memory allocate. This explicitly creates a pointer to a block of memory of a chosen size and uses that as the array instead. You can, for example, store the desired length of the array in a variable and then use that variable to dynamically allocate the memory for your array by using malloc. Note that the asterisk before size of is not dereferencing or declaring a pointer but instead merely a normal multiplication operator. You multiply the number of bytes of memory required for a data type 
by the quantity of slots you want available. This may or may not be confusing, but basically you're telling your computer exactly how much space in bytes you need available based on the length of memory and the data type. For instance, int in C is usually represented by a 32-bit integer. Not in all cases, but in most cases, especially on a normal computer or desktop. And since a byte is 8 bits, the int data type is a total of 4 bytes large. The char data type is only 8 bits. Therefore, a char data type is only a single byte large. Size of is simply determining the number of bytes of a given data type automatically. So if it's an int, it's going to determine that the data type is 4 bytes large. And if it's char, it'll determine that the data type is 1 byte large. Hopefully this is all making sense so far. However, there isn't too much of a reason to learn C's malloc syntax because it's now been superseded by C++'s new keyword, which does exactly the same thing but cleaner, the equivalent line being what's shown below. The new keyword will throw an exception, but with most pre-built functions that we'll be looking at that come from C, it's best practice to add a null check after you've allocated memory. Why? Well, because if your allocation fails, it'll return null, and you can check the null value and then handle the error or exit the program. If you decide to assume on the very next line that your allocation succeeded when it failed and try to access or modify memory that you never successfully allocated, then ladies and gentlemen, you will get a segmentation fault. If you try dereferencing a null pointer, this also leads to a segmentation fault. Segmentation faults happen when you attempt to write or access memory that your program doesn't have access to. Some examples are null pointer dereferencing, trying to write to read only memory, which we will later on do, and accessing memory greater than the length of the allocated block of memory. Pointers created with dynamic memory allocation can be used nearly identically to statically allocated memory. The difference is that since we explicitly reserve the memory, we have to explicitly release it. And this is done by using the free keyword or the delete keyword instead if you use the new syntax in C++. Otherwise, it can lead to a situation called a memory leak. A memory leak occurs when dynamically allocated memory is no longer accessible or referenced by any part of the program, but hasn't been deallocated. This leads to wasted memory and depending on the program can crash it after a certain length of execution. In general, it just causes bugs and poor performance. Usually allocation fails because your system has already allocated all available memory, which isn't always an indication of a memory leak. You could just have very little memory on whatever system is running the program, or allocation failed for some other obscure and bizarre reason, but often it could mean a memory leak. Similarly, memory can be allocated using calic and realloc, which we will soon discuss. Calic, which stands for contiguous allocation, is much simpler than malloc. It dynamically dynamically allocates memory by taking two arguments, the length of the desired block of memory, how many slots you want available, and then the number of bytes of the data type found by size of. It initializes all allocated memory to zero. Unlike malloc, calloc leaves no slots of memory empty. And just like malloc, since the memory has been dynamically allocated, it must be freed using the free keyword once it's no longer being used. And lastly, there is realloc. Realloc is a keyword used for changing and altering the size of an already existing allocated block of memory. Realloc is very similar Similar to malloc, the first argument is the block of memory you want reallocated, essentially the name of the array, and the second argument is identical to malloc, the number of elements you want available in the array multiplied by the number of bytes of the data type found by size of. And you now have a reallocated block of memory with a different size. It's usually good practice to check if allocation was successful, just like in any of these different examples, by adding a null check. And if it wasn't successful, free the old block of memory, and in our case, exit the program. Just like always, if everything Everything works out correctly, you have to free the memory when you're done with it. Similar to arrays, C seems to have something resembling strings, but they don't really exist in the language. C doesn't really have true strings. Instead, just like arrays, they're pointers. In fact, it's not even something that's hidden. In the syntax for initially creating a string, it's blatantly created as a pointer to a variable of type char. A normal string in C is nothing but a block of memory containing characters as bytes and ending with a byte of value zero. The thing which we call a string is simply a pointer to the first of those bytes. C treats text in double quotes as a string in the same fashion, storing it in the compiled program with a zero byte at the end. Creating a string in this manner creates a read-only string, meaning that once the program is compiled, it becomes part of the executable itself. Attempting to modify this string leads to a segmentation fault, or undefined behavior. A better way to create a string would just be to statically allocate an array of bytes and use that instead. Then you can modify the array as much as you want. This even adds a zero byte at the end without you having to. If you attempt to write memory outside the bounds of what's been allocated, 
located, then you'll probably get a segmentation fault. If you go far enough, however, you cause a buffer overflow. This is usually most dangerous when your program takes data from outside sources such as standard input or some sort of protocol. Then someone can do damage by writing more memory to the buffer than the buffer allows. Like memory leaks, buffer overflows are kind of overhyped. It's a vulnerability that's becoming harder and harder to exploit. If you decide to dynamically allocate memory for a string, you can use all of the same methods of working with memory as before, such as using malloc, calloc, or realloc. All three will work. A string is basically just an array of characters, but remember, dynamically allocated memory can be dangerous. Now in order to terminate your string, you have to explicitly add a zero byte at the end, escaping it with a backslash. Otherwise, you can get an ASCII version of zero, which we don't actually want. It might still work, but this isn't technically correct. And if for some reason you can't get the ASCII value, you can just explicitly write the value 48, and if we print this out, you will indeed get a zero. You can also just use a regular value of zero as the null terminator, and this will work just fine as well. You can sort of cheat by using calloc to initialize all bytes as zero, and then fill in the bytes of memory you plan to use to construct your string. I don't know if this is bad practice or not, but I found that it is something you could do to avoid having to add the zero byte manually, and still have a dynamically allocated string on the heap. Now what happens when you don't terminate your string? Well, this this leads to undefined behavior, the program won't know when to stop reading the buffer, and will continue to read until it finds a zero byte. Since we don't have one, who knows when it'll stop. It might run into other memory that happens to have a zero byte, cause a segmentation fault, crash, or just do nothing at all. Also again, don't forget to free your memory once you're done with the dynamically allocated string. In most languages, it's not really possible to have a function that alters its parameters. The best you can do is declare a global variable that gets modified within different scopes. However, a few languages still do have the option to write to function parameters. In functions where the goal is to alter the original variable and not to simply have a copy as a parameter, we can pass variables by reference instead. c -sharp, for instance, has the ability to prefix a parameter with ref, which provides a reference to the variable that was passed in, thus changing the original variable should any mutations occur. In C++, preceding the parameter with an ampersand will reference the value in memory. Now if we alter the variable in the function, the original variable is altered since it's a reference to the original, not a copy. In C, neither of these options are available, so as you may have guessed it, we are forced to use pointers. There's nothing special about how we use them to pass by reference. All we do is pass in a memory address as an argument by either explicitly passing in a pointer or just prefixing a variable with an ampersand. Then within the function parameter, we add an asterisk to declare that the parameter is a pointer. Then within the function body itself, we dereference the value. And now anything we do with the variable will mutate the original, not the copy. By far the biggest reason to use pointers is just optimization. The fattest and largest variables in C are structs or structures. They're the user-defined data type in C that allow you to associate many different variables with a single variable. Then you can access fields on that variable. This is somewhat similar to properties on classes, but definitely not the same. If you have three integers associated with a struct, that struct can end up being 12 bytes large, or larger depending on different padding. Copying a struct's value over and over is simply not efficient. Accessing different fields on a struct are done using dot notation. But another way to access struct fields exists, and that is with arrow syntax. Since accessing values are the same as dereferencing the address where the value lives, the above is identical to the following. This isn't quite so useful when you're dealing with one field, but when you're dealing with nested struct pointers, it can be quite a bit more readable. Otherwise, you have to dereference each field with a layer of parentheses surrounding it. This gets ugly pretty quickly. There's a lot of different reasons you might want to use pointers when dealing with structs instead of just copying the entire value of a struct. Pointers, as you've probably figured out by now, allow you to target dynamically allocated memory at runtime using malloc and new. And this can also be done with structs. This allows for more flexibility than just statically allocating the memory for a struct. Though statically allocated memory is preferred when possible, it isn't always possible. The whole point of using struct pointers this way is to use pointers to memory instead of copying the values of the entire struct just to retrieve or modify a single field, or allocating more memory by inserting an identical value to that of an existing struct. Hopefully this makes sense. Therefore, instead of embedding entire structs inside of other structs, you can just use pointers to different structs. So to answer the question once again, why do we use pointers? Well, as someone once said, it's easier to give someone the address to your house than to give a copy of your house. Pointers can be used to point to basically anything in memory. In C++, you can point to not only arrays, characters, and integers, you can also point to objects, instances of the string class, and built-in data structures from the standard template library. They can be used to create more complex data structures as well, like linked lists, trees, and graphs, which I'll probably cover more in depth in a data structures video 
video, should I ever create one. They're just very useful in general once you understand them. Anyways, I hope you learned something new or got a better understanding, and have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, wherever you may be watching this from.